heals a lame man and claims to be God. Today's afternoon Bible study and devotional will be reading through the book of John chapter 5. <clears throat> Sorry, as I was talking there, I'm like, I need a sip on my coffee. But before we get to the book of John chapter 5, uh, we're going to be reading through Jesus is Calling for Today, November 26, 2021. Holy cow. It's already almost the end of November, um, which is kind of crazy. Uh, so, yeah, a reminder that this is written as if it's Jesus talking to you. Um, it's a devotional book written by Sarah Young, inspired by scripture. And, uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's jump in to Jesus is Calling for November 26. This is the day that I have made. As you rejoice in the days of life, it will yield up to you precious gifts and beneficial training. Walk with me along the high road of thanksgiving, and you will find all the delights I have made ready for you. To, uh, to protect your thankfulness, you must remember that you reside in a fallen world where blessings and sorrows intermingle freely. A constant focus on adversity defeats many Christians. They walk through the day that is brimming with beauty and brightness, seeing only the grayness of their thoughts. Neglecting the practice of giving thanks has darkened their minds how precious are my children who remember to thank me at all times they can walk through the darkest days with joy in their hearts because they know that the light of my presence is still shining on them rejoice in this day that i have made for i am your steadfast companion and that was inspired by three different sections of the bible this is the day the lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it psalm 118 24 i will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the lord psalm 116 17 and lastly you are my god and i will give you thanks you are my God, and I will exalt you. Psalm 118, 28. Um, but no, I, I like that, and it's a reminder, especially if you're having a bad day, that, yeah, God hasn't abandoned you just because you're having a bad day. And you can have confidence and hope, and it makes that bad day a little bit less, knowing and having confidence that God still loves you and is with you and is in control. Even though we might not understand why this, why that, we can have confidence that God is with us, which just lightens everything a little bit more and can help us to carry joy even when we're having bad days. Um, and I think sometimes that messes me up when I'm like, yeah, I'm feeling really down, but I'm also like, I'm not down down, but I'm like, I'm down and I'm feeling depressed and I want to cry. I want to do whatever, but I'm still oddly joyful and it seems counterintuitive because sometimes it's like to understand your emotions you you kind of process things through this worldly lens but there's this hope that never really leaves at least for me uh when it comes to god and it helps me carry and it helps me not just stay in those mindsets uh and when i'm in those mindsets i can still look towards god and it makes them not so bad um, but it 100% doesn't mean that those don't happen. Uh, and I don't want you to hear that. Like, oh yeah, Jeremy doesn't get depressed or sad ever because he's a Christian and I get sad and depressed. So like, what's wrong with me? No, 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 not, not at all. Depression and all that still is something that's heavy. And, um, but there's this weird underlying hope that we don't really see portrayed it's just something that's that's in us that just you know god's presence is still felt even amongst those feelings it's very weird 
Um, and it's hard to describe, but you know, God's presence is still there. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, I'm sorry. Um, maybe ask me direct questions so I might be able to explain it better. Um, but yeah, right now I'm filling in some questions for myself. Uh, but ultimately I don't want you to just lean into me and my thoughts. I'd rather you lean into scripture, like what we've been seeing throughout the book of John, where God asks us to lean in, to taste, to see, to like understand and to ask good questions, not just to like, oh yeah, you think this guy was God and, and died and raised from the dead? Yeah, okay, that ain't happening. You guys are crazy. What's wrong with you? Oh, you think uh, you're drinking his flesh? Oh, oh, or eating his flesh and drinking his blood? Yeah, you guys are like wannabe cannibals because that's just bread and uh, water or, or grape juice or wine or whatever. I don't know why you guys want to be cannibals so much. What's wrong with you? And you could just sit there, mock from afar, or you can lean in to find out what what's really happening. What can I get some clarity in this? Do you guys actually say like for this is my bet my my like what what is this? What's going on? Do you guys actually think Jesus died and then rose again? Like what what's going on? Is there evidence? Is there proof? Like let me lean in here. And that's really what like the book of John is inviting us to lean in and to see if Jesus is God. And a lot of people go, well, Jesus never directly says that he is God, but that's something that we're going to investigate here today in uh, chapter five. But before we get to that, the, the really, really big thing from chapter four was the woman at the well, where here's this person that is looked down upon and most Jewish people wouldn't interact with. And Jesus not only interacts with her, but he being the Messiah goes, I know you. And to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And I encourage you to check out that spoken word poetry. It's beautiful and it's powerful. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll link it in the description this time, I did, or go back and do it for yesterday's video. To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. It's powerful, it's inspired by the woman at the wall. The whole thing is really, really powerful. Um, but there's that leaning in and God knows us and we can be confident that God knows us. And the woman at the well is a great and beautiful example, even when we feel far away from God, that he still knows us. So with that, I invite you guys to open up your Bibles to John chapter 5. And we're going to be talking about Jesus healing a lame man. I don't think it means lame as in like uncool. I think it means lame as in disabled. Um, maybe he has leprosy. I don't really remember. Maybe he's blind. Uh, but it's that, that definition of lame, not uncool. All right. So without further ado, John chapter five, Jesus heals a lame man. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bathsheba with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed lay on the porches. One of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool where the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, Well, Stand up, pick your, up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping bag, bag, or mat, sorry, and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. But 
So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, You can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, The man who healed me told me to pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who healed him. Jesus claims to be the Son of God. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, My father is always working, and so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, but he called God his Father, thereby making himself equal with God. So Jesus explained, explained, I tell you the truth, the Son of Man could do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the Father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. For as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that this that the time is coming indeed it's here now when the dead will hear my voice the voice of the son of god and those who listen will live the father has life in himself and he has granted that same life-giving power to his son and he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the son of man don't be so surprised indeed the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to, the experience, to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just, because I carry out the will of of the one who sent me, not my own will. Witness to Jesus. If I were to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid, but someone else is also testifying about me. And I assure you that everyone he says, uh, uh, sorry, everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist and his testimony about me was true. Of course, I have no need of human witnesses, but I say this, these things uh, so you might be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message, but I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish. And they prove that he sent me. The father who sent me has testified about me, about me himself. You have never heard a voice or seen him face to face. And you do not have his message in your hearts because you do not believe me. The one he sent to you. 
You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to receive this life. Your approval means nothing to me. Because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name, and you have rejected me. Yet, if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other. But you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Yet, it isn't I who will accuse you before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, in whom you put your hopes. If you really believe Moses, you would believe me. Because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe that he wrote what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. All right, so here is a really, really cool piece of scripture here. So, um, once again, like on the Sabbath, you weren't allowed to do any work whatsoever. And here's this lame man. He can't walk. They don't have wheelchairs. The guy is like, yeah. And there's this pool of water that people believed if you touched it, it was like holy water. And it would purify your body, but it was like this thing that happened at this certain time. And when this bubbling happened, some sort of miracle would happen and you get to the water. And everyone was so preoccupied with their own healing, they wouldn't let people in more need get there before them. So you have this lame guy on a mat who's just given up all hope. He's like, I can't, I can't make it there before everyone else. You know, you're like, yeah, I'm in more need of healing, but I, I can't get there. So I can't get healed. I've been, you know, I tried for like five years and now I'm just, I'm done. This is my lot in life. And Jesus says, yeah, but get up your, get up and walk. And I can just picture the guy going like, oh yeah, if I could just get up and walk. And like, he acts it out mockingly and then he's like, what? I'm walking and like he doesn't God just you know totally transformed his life gave him this life that he was never expecting to have like ever again if this happened because of injury or maybe he was just born this way I don't I don't know enough about this guy but he got he picks up his mat and he walks which is breaking the law because carrying your mat is somehow considered work and the Pharisees, who are now, like, judging people and doing whatever, like, they're essentially working by pointing this out. Like, oh, you're breaking the law. Like, uh, the hypocrisy of some <laughs> religious leaders, right? Um, and they're like, who did this? He's like, I don't know. But, like, I've never been able to, to do this as work. This isn't work. This is freedom. Like, I get to carry this right now and I get to walk. <laughs> like he'd be overwhelmed with with this brand new joy and all the pharisees can see is this this man carrying a mat doesn't matter if they've seen him day after day after day unable to move they're more fixated on the mat that he's carrying oh you're going against god because you're carrying the mat a miracle just happened before them. They had seen this man in like next to the stream, not able to get into this water. They've been in the town. They've been walking around. They've seen this guy who hasn't been able to walk for like three decades. And yet they're more worried about the mat. And Jesus uh, confronts him and goes, now that you're well, stop sinning. So what sin was he getting up to while not able to walk, not able to move uh, all that well? We don't know. But there was sin. There was doubt, maybe. Maybe he was just 
angry and bitter and really like as all these other people are going to get healing maybe he just was angry at everyone else that went ahead of him that's something that i i i've seen like around town it's a thought that's entered into my head like you know once again bring that up why did my mom have to have a stroke and not get better right like all these other things were going on lord how come this this one had to happen how come you know my family had to be affected by this and there's a little bit of bitterness that can get worked in a little bit of anger that can get worked in um and but there's still that trust that has to happen there um and uh yeah as the pharisees then they go oh it was jesus let's confront jesus and right away jesus starts saying a ton of offensive things to them oh i am the son of god god is my father which is like no 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 like we're all like what so like this was a loaded statement that he's claiming to be the son of god is a loaded statement for them back then it it's hard to really break down how this would have been received by the pharisees at the time um and a lot of people are like oh the pharisees like it's like a dirty word nowadays but these were the respected religious leaders at the time this would be like saying the priests or uh the reverends or you know what have you uh interacting with you know um someone that just did a miracle and trying to trap them into a lie not actually seeking the truth but trying to find a way to see ah see you're fake and i'm going to kill you like their minds made up they're like this can't happen so like how can we trap this person in a lie how can we how can we convict this person and kill them that's what their mindset is going into this because you enabled that guy to carry a mat and walk what um anyways so and you know all of this stuff's going on so Jesus lays out, yeah, I am the son of God. And then he talks about the witnesses. And he's like, I don't need human witnesses, but John the Baptist came. He laid it out. And you believed him for a while, but then you got me. And I'm not this military leader. I'm not coming in with sword and an army to liberate you from the Romans. And you're disappointed why are you disappointed let's get to it and then he 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 addresses it later on he's like you're disappointed because i don't need your approval oh that would have stung so much for them here are these religious well-respected leaders that everyone's looking to and then you have this messiah that's going around healing people that people are are turning to and following and he's like yeah i don't need your approval I know your hearts. I know what you're doing. I know that you just want to trap me and prove me wrong and kill me. And you're not even really listening to what I'm saying. I don't need your approval. I know what the truth is. And then he starts peeling back these layers until he just straight up finally says it you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is god so we have this picture where he says i'm equal to god i am like god's son and also you know what i alone am actually god so he says it out and he takes a while to paint the picture so as the pharisees lean in and they listen to what he's saying they have the answer for what they're saying. But Jesus is also not going to be like, oh, boom, I'm going to say it. And then people that aren't leaning in are going to be like, ah, see, look, cool, let's kill him. He's painted this picture. The Pharisees get the references. They understand the importance of everything he's saying. He's like, I'm not only am I equal to God, but I alone am God. And, oh, you put all your faith into Moses, but guess what? Everything that moses was talking about his teachings were pointing to jesus pointing to him and once again we have that picture that that lifts up the old testament 
as this unified story that points towards Jesus. And there's this warning in here that if we use the scripture and the scripture is what we think is what's going to get us saved, we are falling short. The Bible isn't what gets us saved. It's not the Bible. The Bible is a fantastic uh, um, a historical document, a, a fantastic religious document. It is this 66 book library of love letters from God to us. But it all points towards Jesus and Jesus and our faith in him and what he did on the cross is what redeems us, saves us, rescues us, reconciles us to God. So, and he says it so plainly. Uh, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think they will give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. So there's a couple things in here. We can just sit on scripture and figure out, okay, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this wrong? Is this right? Is this right? Is this right? Is this right? And then we kind of miss some of those bigger pictures sometimes. I think tattoos is a prime example. It was written for specific people at a specific time or the types of food that we eat. Like, oh, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. And there's a lot of people that still do that. But you know what? You read other parts of the scripture and it goes, yeah, this is okay now. And then, and a, so much of Hebrew writings is like, this extreme isn't allowed, but this extreme in the exact same situation is allowed. So in this scenario, it's bad. In this scenario, that exact same action is good and encouraged. And then, so the truth of the matter lies somewhere in the middle. And when we just use scripture as the main point, when we hear the word, you need to take the, the, the Lord's day and rest, we can make it so legalistic that even if you are the receiving end of a huge miracle, you're not allowed to pick up your mat and walk home. For him, Picking up that mat wasn't work. It, in that moment, picking up that mat was so far away from work. But when we lift up scripture to be above God, we can make it so that picking up that mat is walking. So there is a warning laid out in the scripture, a warning that is really tough. Because how do we use this in such a way that it has power and authority over our lives, but not put it above God? And that is something that some of the best people, some of the biggest minds have been trying to do. Because the best way to know God's heart and his desire for our lives is in this book. The best way to understand Jesus is in this book. The best way to understand God is in this book. But remember, this is a giant arrow pointing to Jesus and into our world, into our lives, even here today in the present. We don't worship the arrow. We worship what the arrow points to. That's Jesus. Um... And something I'm trying to get out of the habit of, and something that I've been guilty of, is using, saying that this is the word of God. Um, the word of God is Jesus. This is a collaboration effort between God and humanity. It's God inspired. Um, it is like God had his hand in making this, but it's a collaboration library between God and humanity. Jesus is the word of God. So I'm, I'm trying 
currently to drop calling the Bible the Word of God for that reminder that Jesus is the Word of God and that it all of Scripture points towards Jesus um, and in order not to put Jesus below the Bible not to put God below the Bible not to put the Holy Spirit below the Bible and it's it's a tough balancing act because this is the most important book ever written it is the most important book most influential book and it is like god's inspiration and breath is throughout this book but the book that i was holding in my hands is ink and paper put together the scripture is going to last long beyond that book and it all points towards jesus let's pray a j c awesome jesus christ i thank you so much for all the ways that you love us you bless us you guide us and you direct us thank you for all the different motivations and i thank you that we have the bible that points directly to you that all of scripture points directly to you the old testament the New Testament, even Revelation, points to you. So help us to put our faith and our trust in you. And I thank you for how you laid it out, that you are not only equal to God, but you are, in fact, God. You are fully human and fully God. And that mystery and how that all works may be a mystery until we die and go to heaven. But you've laid it out. You have fulfilled so much of the Old Testament prophecies. Like... Lord, you are who you say you are. And you took so much time to lay it out and explain it. If only the Pharisees were willing to lean in. That, yes, Lord, you didn't need the Pharisees' um, approval because you have God's approval, God the Father's approval. You are truth. You are above them. So you don't need their approval. You don't need humanity's approval, yet you use John the Baptist to be your witness. And you healed because God never, like, God never takes a rest. He's always working. He rested after the seventh day. But you are at work all the time. And I thank you that things aren't, like, boiled down to these super legalistic things where... Carrying a mat is work anymore. That we don't live in such constrained times anymore. So Lord, help us to learn what it actually means to rest. Because if rest is just defined as the absence of work, then you know it's easy to do it. But this also shows us, Lord, that resting good sabbath resting is beyond just not doing anything there's something else that needs to be happening so lord help us to understand and help us to develop patterns that help us to rest well in the way that you have designed rest to be lord help us to look to your word to gain insight into our own lives and how you're interacting with us in our own lives and how the whole Bible points to Jesus. Help us to understand all of that and help us to really hold the Bible in this precious, uh, authoritative position in our lives, but never to put it above you. Never to put it above you, Lord. And help us find that balance and help us to not seek the approval of others it's so easy to try to seek the approval of others especially religious leaders in our lives but help us to seek approval from you first and foremost if we are seeking approval lord i thank you so much for the book of john chapter five and uh for Jesus is calling for today that no matter how bad our day is, you have not left us or forsaken us. 
that you are with us and you know us. Help us to find joy and to feel your presence this day. Whether we're having a great time, a stressful time, and we're taking advantage of the Black Friday deals or whatever it is, Lord. Help us to feel your presence close to us and help us to live you out amongst people, especially if we are doing Black Friday shopping. Help us to have your love and your hope and your forgiveness and your patience on the end of our sleeves. Thank you so much, Lord, and your generosity. And so, yeah, Lord, help us to do what is right and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you, Lord. Thank you very much. Amen. All right. Well, uh, that is it for today. Uh, looking forward to tomorrow, where we'll be getting into John chapter 6. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much once again. Have a fantastic day. God bless. Bye.